Morning everyone, uh, it's Tom here from Pragma. Hope you're all okay and getting used, some, used to working from home. Um, thanks for joining. Um, we're going to get started straight away um, just to, to get things going. Um, just a few house rules. You're obviously all on mute, but any questions that come up at any point during this webinar, uh, there's a chat function. Um, you can raise your hand or just send a quick message. Uh, and I've got my colleague Helen monitoring those for us as well. So she'll respond to those as we go along. Um, if we do miss any points, though, we can always catch up afterwards. Um, this is the first of the webinar series that Pragma are hosting. Um, this is Intro to Telecommunications. Um, it's a very basic introduction and it's designed for people who are new to the telecoms industry um, and have no background knowledge. So if you have I can see a few names on the right hand side here already of people who I know um, and I would say are quite experienced and it may be a little bit too basic for you guys so I won't be offended if you want to drop out uh, but by all means if you've got a spare half an hour 45 minutes and you want to carry on listening and watching by all means do. Right let's get started. Um, So the first thing that we're going to cover today in the intro to telecoms is the different types of lines that there are out there um, and why people use them. So just to start, who owns the network? Um, so as you all may be aware, on the left hand side, you may recognize the van. Um, that is the open reach van. Um, That is the OpenReach fan. OpenReach maintain and look after the network um, and hundreds of telecoms companies across the UK buy from OpenReach and then sell on. Obviously, um, telecoms companies, we buy at a much cheaper rate from OpenReach and then we sell it onto our customers to make a profit. Uh, on the right hand side, you'll recognise the green cabinets. Um, you'll see them across industrial estates, housing estates, anywhere on the side of the road. Um, this is where most of the infrastructure is held. Um, you'll often see an open reach engineer working in there. Um, but the green cabinet that you see on the side of the roads is very important and we're going to start. To see. Uh, one thing I just always like to point out is BT did use to own open reach. Uh, they famously no longer do. Um, it was a bit of a conflict of interest. So from our point of view or from your point of view, your telecoms company is no diff at a different level of service from OpenReach than BT gets officially. So first type of line I want to touch on is analog lines. So an analog line is a very, very basic type of communication. Um, I compare it to a tin can and a bit of string. Um, the analog service starts here at the telephone exchange. Um, now you'll see this picture more and more as over the next few slides. However, just to give you a bit of introduction to a telephone exchange, it's usually an old building. Uh, looks a bit like a school or a fire station because of when it was built. But essentially, what is in there is all the information. So this is where everything connects back to, and you'd usually find a telephone exchange in large town or a city and then from the telephone exchange a great big large copper cable will run to the green boxes that you'll see on the side of the road uh, and then from there the box is almost a bit like a junction box it splits the cable into multiple lines and then feeds it out to the different businesses and different houses um, an analog line is probably what you guys have got at home for your main telephone line or your broadband that comes to your house. Um, businesses years and years and years ago used to use analog lines very regularly uh, as it was the only form of communication. Um, the only thing with an analog line is the amount of concurrent calls that you can have is uh, lines that you have. So if you've got one analog line, you can only have one call. And then if somebody then goes to ring you again, you're engaged. Um, analog lines are also used to deliver broadband as well, but we're going to come on to that a little bit later. ISDN. Um, so a few of you may remember when we did the digital switch over on the tellies and we went from the analog service to the digital service. Um, 
and famously we did the same in the telecoms industry um it was quite a long long time ago now that we did that and we started telling people that isdm was the future um and that analog lines were no longer what they needed isdm brought a whole host of new features to customers at the time um, i'm not going to go over those features now because if i tell you them you'll think well that's basic to left me um because it where people have been using isdm for years isdn is a lot more famous in businesses um very very unlikely that you'd have an isdn circuit at home um but what isdn is is it's still a copper cable that's delivered from the telephone exchange to the green cabinet and then from there we bond two copper cables together and deliver them to your property um, your business and then that gives you the ability to be able to make two concurrent phone calls at the same time uh, under the same telephone number. So if your telephone number was 01789 207 300, for example, um, and you had two ISDNs on there, um, you would then have the ability to have two concurrent phone calls at the same time. The one disadvantage of ISDN is that it comes in pairs. So you would have two to start with, and then you could purchase a further two, which would make it four, and then a further two, which would make it six, and so on and so forth. Um, with that, obviously, you are paying for two sets of line every time, so it can work out to be quite expensive. It is two telephone lines that BT have to physically, or open reach, I should say, have to physically install. So the um, wait time is very long. Um, and obviously, it's very cost effective. It's not very cost effective at all. Analog versus digital. So just to give you an idea um, to compare it for customers, um, an example that we use is A roads and motorways. Um, with an A road, you can obviously there's only one lane, um, so you can only have one car at a time. Same with an analog, you've only got one line, so you can only have one call at a time. Uh, and the same with motorways. Um, so with ISDN, you've got multiple channels. Uh, on the motorway, you've got multiple lanes, so you can have more than one car at the same time. Uh, with an ISDN, you've got multiple channels, so you can have more than one call at the same time. Uh, and that's a good example of how we put it forward to customers. Um, a few of you um, will have heard the terminology SIP trunk. Um, if you're not completely new to the telecom industry, um, what SIP trunks are is we're getting rid of the telephone exchange on the left hand side. We're now getting rid of this green box. And this is what we're implementing. So SIP trunks will come from a, a data center, um, a bit more modern than the old school telephone exchange that you'll see in the previous picture. Uh, a lot more secure uh, and there's a lot more technology happening within a data center. So from the data center, we will push uh, SIP trunks down to the router via an internet connection. And then the router is obviously in, inside the business's offices. And then from there, they're accessing their SIP trunks. Uh, with SIP trunks, you can have as many as you like, or you can have as uh, just one. Um, so it's up to you guys, up to your end user, what they need. Um, another benefit of SIP trunks is that uh, they're quite cost effective. Um, they're a lot cheaper than ISDN. Um, we can install them instantly if required. It's just a matter of turning it up like volume. Um, and the other benefit as well is because there's no geographical, um, we're not relying on a green box, we can have whatever telephone number that we like. So for example, if you're a business in Birmingham, you can display a Manchester number. Um, to put this into a comparison for you guys in the real world thing that's something that everyone uses every day, it's a little bit like Blockbuster and Netflix. Um, so with Blockbuster, you'd have to physically go and get the DVD, take it home, put it in the DVD player and watch it, or video, if it was that old school. Um, ISDN or analog is exactly the same. So you've got to have an actual physical bit of equipment there for analog or digital lines to work. Um, and then Netflix came along. Um, Netflix basically is that the same as SIP trunks um, all the DVDs are sat in a data center and you just access it by paying a monthly fee exactly the same with SIP trunks um, your lines are sat in a data center and you're just using your internet connection um, to access it for a monthly fee um, one of the obvious things here is that like at home if you don't have an internet connection Netflix doesn't work 
Um, same with six months. If your customer doesn't have an internet connection, their six months won't work. Or if they have a very poor internet connection, they'll work, but not to a great speed or quality. Something just to be aware of. So that brings us on quite nicely to connectivity. Uh, and like I said, this is only a basic overview. We're not an internet provider at all. Um, so we're not going to go into too much detail on this. We're just going to give you the basic terminology and the different types of internet connectivity that we see important to you guys. So we've got a nice little image here to explain how connectivity is delivered to your customer. So let's say your customer is one of these buildings on the left hand side here. And then you've got the BT exchange on the right hand side. So I've made the photo look a little bit nicer than the, the boring one that we saw earlier. Uh, but essentially we've got the BT exchange here in blue. And from there, a, a telephone line or a, a copper cable is delivered to the green cabinet. And then from there, we're accessing one of the telephone lines to deliver it to the business. Um, the first type of internet connectivity I want to make you aware of is ADSL. So very basic internet connectivity. Uh, and 99.9% .9 of businesses can get ADSL in the UK. Um, and how that's delivered is there's a big long copper cable that's run from the exchange into the street cabinet. And then from there, another copper telephone line goes into the business. Uh, and that gives them ADSL. ADSL can only deliver speeds of up to 24 meg, uh, and it's all copper, so it's not very fast at all. The next type of internet connectivity to make you aware of is FTTC. Um, BT have got a product name for this, it's obviously called BT Infinity. Um, so if anybody's talking to you about Infinity, it's the same as FTTC. Um, FTTC stands for Fibre to the Cabinet. And so what happens here is there's a fiber line that's run from the exchange to the cabinet. And then from there, we use an analog line to deliver it to the premises. So it's still an analog line to the customer's offices, um, but from the actual green cabinet, it's a fiber line. So it's not fiber all the way to the front door, it's fiber to their local green cabinet. Uh, FTTC, we can deliver anything up to 86 meg. Um, but obviously that varies depending on how far away the business is from the cabinet and how far away the cabinet is from the local exchange. And then moving on from FTTC, we've got FTTP, which is fibre to the premise. Uh, and from there, what we can do is we run fibre from the BT exchange all the way to the customer's front door. It does run fire the local cabinet, but it um, still goes all the way to the front. And that'll deliver speeds of anything up to 120 meg. And then last but not least, the last one I'm going to tell you about is a lease line. Um, so a lease line comes from the BT exchange or any other ISPs exchange. So you, you may be familiar with businesses like Talk Talk, um, Glide, Spectrum, people like that who will have their own network, but that's a conversation for a different day. But essentially what a lease line is, it's a dedicated route from the exchange all the way to your customer's offices. Obviously, that's quite expensive. It's like them having their own private road. Uh, and then we decide what speeds are then pumped along those internet. Uh, one other thing I just wanted to give you an idea of was usage. Um, so just a bit of an idea of activ uh, an activity. So one hour web browsing will only use between 10 to 25 mega data. Uh, an hour on Facebook will only use 20 megadata. Downloading a HD film will use 4 gig. And then streaming an hour of music or radio is 150 meg. There's lots of different examples on there, but you'll quite often have a customer say, well, how much, how much data do I need? How much data do I require? Most services now are unlimited. Um, but just in case you're working with a customer who doesn't understand what they actually need to be aware of in terms of data usage, there's just a few ideas of what uses what there. So that was that on connectivity, very basic overview. Like I said, we're not an ISP, so I don't want to go into too much detail on it. Um, this is more about just giving you a basic overview of the industry. So moving on to types of cabling. So this is talking about what's actually inside a customer's offices now and what you need to be aware of. Uh, and the different things that are there. So internally, we have two different types of connections that you need to be aware of. 
Um, they've got loads of different names for them, as we like to do in the telecoms industry. We like to give things an abbreviation or uh, give it a different name when it essentially will mean the same thing. But the two popular ones are RJ45 and RJ11. RJ45 is also known as Cat5 connector. So the green cable that you see on the right hand side is an example of a Cat5 cable. Um, but the RJ45 is very similar to what you would probably be sticking into the back of your router to connect um, to your laptop if you weren't using Wi Fi. Um, Cat5 cable or RJ5 connectors are popular in businesses' offices um, because you can transfer voice as well as data through them. So a lot of the time, an IP phone, and we'll come on to types of phone later, will connect via a Cat5 cable to an RJ45 point, which will then connect back to the telephone system. And an RJ11, so the bottom one is a little bit more old school, um, and it's likely to be what you have at home where your analog telephone line comes in and you've got your old telephone connected into it. There is a difference between the two. There's obviously a slight difference, and it's different connectors that go into it. Um, and what you'd probably have at home is your analog line come in with an RJ11 on it, which you then connect into the back of your router, which then would the router will then pump out Wi-Fi to the rest of your house. Um, RJ11 is not so common in businesses anymore. Uh, the type of businesses where you'll find it is, is somewhere like schools, hotels, um, older buildings um, where they haven't been able to upgrade their cabling infrastructure because it's very expensive. Um, it's very tricky to do all the runs. So they've just stuck with RJ11 over time, which means they can't transfer data down an RJ11 cable. Now, just to give you an idea of where this now fits in, we've got the green box outside, so the street cabinet, which then feeds into the property. And then inside the property, we'll have this nice, and hopefully it looks like this, cabinet. And in the cabinet, we've got lots of switches and lots of cables. Uh, in there, we like to have a telephone system, which is what we sell. Uh, a PoE switch, which provides power to devices on the network. And then a patch panel. Uh, patch panel is almost like a go between the two. And this is the center. This is where everything is either cabled back to or cabled into. So you, usually your telephone lines will come into here and sit next to your telephone system. And then where all your handsets, which are laid out on the desks, will then feed back either via a Cat5 cable or an RJ45 cable back to your telephone system. And it'll all be terminated here. So now a basic intro to actual telephone systems and the different things that a telephone system can do. So then and now, where the telephone system came from. So for those of you that I doubt anybody would remember these days, but we used to have operators. So if you wanted to call through to somebody or you'd call a business, you'd have an operator who would physically unpatch the one call and patch you through. Obviously, like with many jobs, the operator's job was slowly phased out and replaced by a telephone system or a computer. And now what the telephone system does is accept a call and it will transfer it through to the correct person. Human intervention is still required in most scenarios, but for those of you who have ever called a bank or a large organization, um, you will be familiar with the press one, press two, press three setup. Um, those are called auto attendants, and what they will do is they'll push the call through to the correct department via different features. That's a, a different course where we'll go into details on those. So the black box that you see below is an example of our telephone system. So that's actually a UCP uh, and the brand is IPEX. Um, but one of the things that we just need to think that we may make you aware of is lots of people are talking about having a cloud phone system. Lots of people are talking about having an on-prem phone system. Um, the reason the IPEX brand is so strong, or the Ericsson LG, is that um, we can deploy this in two methods. So you can, your customer can have it in the cloud or they can have it in the cupboard. Um, the reason I want to make you aware of this is you may be speaking to a customer and they say, oh, no, we're going for a cloud phone system. And you may think, oh, all right, there's nothing we can do now. Completely wrong. They can have it in both formats and we can deploy it with the same technology. So it's completely 
up to your customer. The only difference is, is how they want to pay for it. Cupboard's got one option of purchasing and Cloud's got another. So telephone system, what the handsets actually look like. So there's three different types of handsets that's probably just need to make you aware of. On the left hand side, we've got a photo of our old digital handsets and where these are traditionally found is with 13 year old babies. So where your customers got old, old RJ45 cabling and they need to connect it in. So they've got old cabling and they want to connect the digital handsets in. Digital handsets still provide all the modern day features. Um, obviously they don't look as, as nice as the newer ones that we've got here on the right hand side, uh, but they still provide all the same features. Uh, in the middle, we've got the IP handset range, and these are the more popular of the ones. These are what we deploy on cloud or most of the time uh, and with on-prem as well. So this is where your customer's got Cat5 cabling. Uh, and we can set it down. These can work remotely, so they can people can take these home and plug them in and they will work exactly the same, or they can work from the office. These are the most popular handsets that we sell. And again, they've got all the same features as the digital handsets. It's just a lot more popular that businesses will have Cat5. And with this type of handset range, you'll be able to work from home. And then on the right hand side, we've got a very old school type of handset. Uh, this is actually a photo of a BT Elements for those of you who are more familiar with those. Um, but what this is actually is, is an analog handset. So an analog handset is a very, very basic handset. And all you can normally do on analog handset is answer calls, transfer calls, uh, and hang up. There's not a lot of features to it. So an example of an analog handset is like here. So a basic walk around like you've got at home. Hopefully your home phone looks a little bit nicer than this um, or within a hotel room. So usually the phones that are in a hotel room are analog phones uh, because all the hotel wants to be able to give the features of is to be able to ring down to reception. Analog phones don't use Cat5 cabling. They use the same type of cabling as a digital handset, um, but they don't have all the same features as a digital handset. They're still very, very basic. So very similar to exactly the same as what you probably have at home. So reasons to change. Um, obviously, what we're all doing here is getting people to change their telephone systems. Um, and here are some of the, I wanted to give you some of the common reasons why people look to change their phone system. Um, obviously, there's a very, very popular one at the moment, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, but I thought I'd give you some of the examples. ISDN switch off. So earlier we spoke about digital telephone lines um, and I didn't go into too many reasons of the downside of it. Um, the ISDN network is a very uh, costly network for OpenReach to maintain. So OpenReach decided that in 2025 that they'll be switching off the ISDN network. So customers can no longer order new ISDN lines. Um, and if they haven't changed their ISDN lines to cloud or SIP trunks by 2025, they'll be switched off. So no more telephone calls. So it's all about making sure that your customer is ready for the ISDN switch off. Um, it's a win-win really for the customers because ISDNs are quite expensive. They're not very flexible at all. There's not a lot of features to them. Um, there was when they were originally launched, but now they're quite old technology. Um, and there's loads more that you can do with a cloud phone system or a with SIP trunks than you can with ISDN. So one of the main things you need to be thinking of with customers that you're talking to or new prospects is what are they going to do when their lines are switched off if they've got ISDN in contact. Cost reduction. Um, people like to save money um, and that's a reason for them to swap a phone system as well. So like I said before, if they've got ISDN lines at the moment and they've got a lot of them, usually that is more expensive than to invest in SIP trunks or some form of cloud technology. Um, so there's a cost saving there. There's an argument that older telephone systems use more energy as well within a property um, and they aren't cost effective that way. Um, the other example is maintenance. As older phone systems get 
um, harder to maintain. Obviously, the cost of maintenance of them will go up. Um, and they've got to be up to date with the latest technology. So maintainers, a little bit like us, will look to increase the cost of old telephones to hardware and it starts to get a little bit more specific. So we um, look to push them towards new technology to help them reduce costs that way. CRM integration. Um, most businesses will have spent thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds on their CRM, giving different contacts, different labels, changing the way that their business process flows. Lots of different examples of why a business would need a CRM. Um, but the thing is, one thing they probably don't realize is that they can integrate their phone system with their CRM so that when a customer would call in or a new prospect, it alerts the sales agent of who it is that's calling um, before they answer the phone so they can be prepared for that call. Um, it also pops that customer's page in the database so that right straight away you can start entering the information about them. It can log to say that this is when the call was made, this is when this client called in. There's so much we can get from a CRM that we can push back from the phone system. So businesses will spend thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds to make sure they've got the latest software. So why wouldn't they do the same to make sure that it integrates with their phone system? Mobility. Obviously, this is a massive one at the moment. Lots of people are looking to work from home. Um, and this has suddenly been a big eye opener to businesses is that they're not prepared for an event like this. Now we have loads of different ways that you can work from home. You can simply unplug one of your IP handsets, unplug that into the internet connection at home and fantastic, you're working. We have mobile apps, so we can drop an app onto a mobile phone, which then makes you part of the phone system. So all you have to do is open up the app and you're calling out from your company's main number. People can transfer calls internally to you. Or we have soft phones. So we can install an actual physical phone on your PC and you can make and receive calls via your PC and using a headset or using a loudspeaker. I'm not going to go into the into the obvious thing that's made this popular, um, but lots of businesses need to be aware that they can work from home um, and give them flexible work, and especially with everything that's going on. Refresh time. Um, like I said, there's the cost element. There's different types of cabling, but the most popular one is who doesn't want a shiny new bit of equipment on their desk? Uh, phones start to look dated after a certain amount of time. You change your mobile handset every two years. So why wouldn't businesses want to do the same with their phone system? Um, at the end of the day, it's part of the desk. It's part of the office environment. It needs to look nice. Um, and with the latest handset on their desk, it's going to. Uh, another popular one is just internet speed as well. So as OpenReach improved the infrastructure, internet infrastructure in the UK, it means that people are going to get access to better technologies, uh, and along with that comes phone system. So people may be looking to upgrade to the cl a cloud phone system now that they've got a better internet connection than before. All of those reasons to change, we will be covering in a separate set of webinars. So we'll be going into more details about CRM integration, how to upgrade your customer to cloud effectively, um, and some of the other different features and benefits that come with cloud phone systems and on-prem phone systems. Um, and that is a different set of webinars. Hopefully that's given you a good insight into the telecoms industries. If there's any specific questions about types of lines or types of cabling, or you do want to know a little bit more, please get in touch with your account manager or myself, uh, and we're happy to chat it through. Um, but we just wanted to give you a, an overview of what's, what's out there and what's available.